Well, guys, we're moving forward in this series, The Good Life. I told you that we are walking through a book uh, my mentor wrote last year called The Good Life, Dr. Derwin Gray. And this uh, is walking through the Beatitudes. And today we're going to be moving forward. We, we went to Matthew chapter number five. We started around verse number one. And last Sunday we looked at uh, this, this message in Jesus' sermon, uh, Bless all the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This Sunday we're going to move a little bit further as we go down to address something that I think we all tried to deal with. And that is how we deal with being sad. This sadness that I think uh, uh, many of us, some of us have dealt with actually in the last year, specifically in 2020, mourning uh, the loss of so many different things. And, and how do we deal with that? What does that look like? What does that mean specifically? And, and how is it that what Scripture says here in Matthew chapter number 5, verse 4, that blessed are those or happy are those that mourn? Let's look at it. Matthew chapter number 5, verse 4 is what we're looking at today. It says, blessed are those who mourn. Watch this. For they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It seems like the, uh, a crazy idea, just like what we talked about last Sunday, Vertical Church. Uh, blessed or happy are the poor in spirit. How in the world is someone that's poor in spirit happy? How can they be blessed? And in the same way, a person that mourns, how in the world can they be blessed? How can they be happy? And that's what we want to talk about today. And, and really what this idea is, because I think sometimes we misunderstand what this means. And, and I want to give you our main idea today, our, our major focus. Write this down if you can. Our big idea today is this. Happy are the brokenhearted, watch this, whose hearts are broken for the same things that break God's heart. Happy are the brokenhearted whose hearts are broken for the same things that break God's heart. See, that's what this text is talking about here. Blessed are those who, who mourn, whose hearts are broken for, for the same exact things that God's heart is broken for. I want you to think about that for a minute. Is your heart broken for the same thing that breaks God's heart? Are you sad about the same things that God is sad about? Do, do you mourn the same things that God mourns. I, I, just, I just want you to think about this for a minute because we're talking about what Jesus defines as happiness, how we become exactly what God has designed us to be. We, we, we get lost in God. We lose our life in God. And in losing our life in God, we actually find life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. T today, I, I want to make sure that, that, hear what I'm saying, that you're sad that you're brokenhearted, watch this, in God. And in this context here, we see where Jesus actually connects these two statements because both of them are, are kind of challenging to understand. In the beginning of his sermon, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, but also blessed are those that have experienced loss. Here it is, they mourn the loss of sin. Write that down. They, they are mourning the loss of sin. They're, this word mourn uh, uh, comes from this, this Greek word to be sad, or another word is to lament. And here it is that, that, that the, we as a believers, we are called, and as we mature in our faith, as we are being sanctified, God, guess this, we will actually mourn the same things that God mourns. We will lament over the same thing that God laments. We will be brokenhearted and sad about the same things. Let's look at this. I wanted to make sure you understand what we're talking about here. So here it is. I want to give you three things that God actually mourns and uh, things that breaks his heart. Write this down. The heart of God is broken by sin injustice, and suffering. The heart of God is broken by sin, injustice, and suffering. Is your heart broken by sin? Is your, is your heart broken by injustice? Is your heart broken by suffering? Well, let's get some context for this for a minute here. Uh, sin, let's look at it. The heart of God is broken by sin. Sin, in its simplest form, is idolatry. Sin in its simplest form is primarily self-idolatry, worship of self, pretty much saying that, that I am at war with God. My way is better than God's way. 
Anything out of the righteousness of God or out of the way that God would do it, that is sin. You guys, we say it all the time here at Vertical Church, in the middle of your sin is what? I. Now, we, we, God not only is brokenhearted by our individual sin, but corporate sin. We know that he hates us. It breaks his heart. We know this because if we go back and look at the Ten Commandments, what, what does this first commandment tell us to do? To have no other God before our God. This is idolatry, even when it's self. You, you, you got to see this, that, that, that God hates sin. He is brokenhearted by sin. And actually, those first uh, uh, few uh, 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 Ten Commandments, those first commandments, the first four of those, they actually start dealing with how you relate to God, how your relationship with, is with God, and what separates you from God, this sin, this, this self-idolatry, this self-worship. Jesus best summarizes it in the great commandment. We've heard it before that when they asked Jesus, the, the, the lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So, so idolatry, this sin nature, is, is something that God, that breaks his heart. The second thing that we see that breaks God's heart is injustice. Injustice, this unfair treatment of others. This injustice is something that breaks the heart of God. All throughout Scripture, we see where the issue uh, that God, that Jesus has most often is not just a sin issue between us and God, but is a justice issue between us and one another. H how do we know this? Let's go back to the Ten Commandments. We, can t we go back to the Pentateuch here, and we can look at these Ten Commandments, and the last half of the Ten Commandments still uh, deal with justice. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. They're talking about how you deal with other people. And so Jesus actually summarizes it like this. So first he says he deals with the sin thing, the idolatry thing. He says, listen, Love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your mind, all your heart, and all your strength. Then he deals with this justice part. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see it? Here are the things that breaks God's heart. And the question you have to ask yourself, do those things break your heart? Actually, when Jesus is actually speaking about loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, he's actually talking about Leviticus chapter number 9 verses, uh, excuse me, Leviticus 19 verses 9 through 19. And in actually verses 9 through 19, actually here God is painting the picture of what it looks like for a believer to love one another. What am I saying? That love, write this down if you can, looks like justice. Yeah, yeah, love looks like justice. He says simply here, don't steal from your neighbor. That's love. Go, go read it for yourself. Leviticus chapter number 19, verses 9 through 19. I want to read it to you. I just want you to listen closely because I want us to see that love looks like justice. It looks like fair treatment. And one of the reasons why I want to read this out because I know in our culture and context, there are people in our culture that feel like justice is not a gospel issue. No, 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 no. All throughout Scripture, the Bible shows us how God feels about justice socially for our culture. Let's read the Bible. It's this is verse number nine. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. Verse 10, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall watch this church, leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. It's, it's this idea that I'm going to walk in somebody else's shoes and I'm going to use my privilege and my influence and my resources to make sure somebody else is blessed. Justice. He says, I am the Lord your God. Verse 11 says, you shall not steal. Justice. This is what love looks like. Justice. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely. You And so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear God. I am the Lord. Verse 15, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer. Uh, you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor in righteousness. What is right? 
You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord." You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. Here it is. He's talking about this justice issue with others. What am I saying? That justice between us as human beings, as people of God, when it's not done right, it breaks the heart of God. And lastly here, we we see where we know that God, what breaks his heart is suffering. The suffering of mankind on any level, it breaks the heart of God. So much so that he would allow his only son to die on the cross and suffer for us so that we would not have to suffer in eternity. These are the things that breaks God's heart. And Jesus says here, watch this, happy are they that mourn. Happy are they that are sad. Happy are they, are you with me, that, 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 that are lamenting, watch this, sin. They, they mourn those things that, that God mourns. Happy are they that are brokenhearted because of injustice. Happy are they that that are brokenhearted and saddened by the suffering in this world. Those, the Bible says, blessed are those. And so we talk about this word mourning. We're talking about, again, this word sadness. We're talking about to lament. We're talking about a deep wailing, a crying, a deep hurt because of sin. This is what we call, write this down if you can, a holy sorrow. There are definitely places in Scripture and places in our life where we will mourn, uh, and it's not necessarily because of our sin. We grieve certain things, but specifically what we all need to have all the time is a holy sorrow, this this lamenting in our heart. Uh, There is a place for us specifically to be encouraged, knowing that even now, well, there are so many of us that have lost loved ones in light of uh, the past year, whether related to COVID-19 or not. Some of us have lost jobs, experiences, things that we are used to. And the Bible encourages us, actually, David says, Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. But what we're talking about today, mourning is a holy hurt. And I want to really deal with this, especially in our culture and context, because sometimes, watch this, we, we, are, we are hurt by situations. We, we are saddened by the injustices that take place in our culture. We, we, we are brokenhearted by seeing other people suffer. But today, I really want you to wrestle with this. Are you as brokenhearted? Are you as frustrated and disappointed? about your own sin as you are about the injustices in our culture, about those that suffer. Do do you have a broken heart? Do you mourn sin and unrighteousness? Is there a deep wailing and crying? Because The same lament that many of us had that causes us to go out and march, the same lament that many of us had that calls calls us to to, to type certain things and and post certain things on our social media, the same things that calls us to to, to go out and, and speak down on others, do you have that same lament for your sin? Does your sin break your heart? Does your own personal unrighteousness Break your heart. The Bible says, blessed are those, happy are those that mourn. Mourn what? Mourn the loss that we experience because of our sin. What do we lose? We lose relationship with God. That's what sin did. It separated us. Do you mourn that? 
The Bible doesn't say, Jesus does not say the person that mourned as in past tense, as if it were something that only happened one time. But no, this, this person has the posture of mourning. It is a constant growing, everlasting thing that every single day that I realize, I remember that I, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and I still fall, I still make mistakes. But when I do, I mourn them, and it calls me to lament. It causes me to cry out to God, oh, wretched man am I do you mourn your sin see today I want to get into a couple of things I believe are going to be helpful for us because I believe we understand that that this happiness comes not just when we mourn our sin but when we understand that the sin that we mourn there is a savior that this very thing that breaks our heart, our own sin should break our heart, but we also are comforted, as the text says, by a Savior that saves us. So let's, let's, let's go through the text real quick. Number one, I want you to write this down. Happy are they that are brokenhearted. Watch this, by personal sin. Happy are they that are brokenhearted by personal sin. Let me just say this very quickly. That some of us, we lament and we get upset and we get angry with other people's sin and other people's unrighteousness and other people's flaws, but you don't get angry with yours. Let me tell you something. A critical part of your embracing the, the gospel is you have to, in some place, some point lament and be sad and sorrowful and be brokenhearted about your own sin. Watch this. Not that you got caught. <laughs> Not that you're sad about the penalty of sin, but the fact that you are unrighteous. Are we saddened by our sin or are we just saddened by the consequences? I, I got to be honest with you. I've had situations in my life. Be honest, I, I, I remember sneaking out of my house. Let me just tell you this story. I was sneaking out of the house, and I remember I tried to sneak back in, and uh, just students, teens, let me help you understand something. Uh, your parents can hear everything. And I remember I, I got back into the house, and, and my mother was sitting in the kitchen. Uh, she was waiting for me. And I remember um, I was really just sad and upset that I got caught. I wasn't sad about what I did. Y'all didn't hear me. I wasn't really broken up about what happened. Uh, I was kind of disappointed that I disappointed my mother. My, my real problem was that I didn't figure out a way to get what I wanted. Y'all ain't hear me. And sometimes this is the sadness we have. And no, no, no. We can't just be saddened and brokenhearted that God found us out. No, we have to be saddened and brokenhearted for what we have done, our sinful nature, our personal sin. Yeah, the idea that you have sinned against God. This is not even just a feeling of conviction for what's wrong, but it is a feeling of being saddened that you, you have sinned in the sight of God. Lamenting, mourning, and being saddened by your sin is a part of the process of salvation. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It is the high awareness of the sin, watch this, that breaks your heart because sin breaks God's heart. Your sin breaks the heart of God. Yes, he still loves you. Yes, he forgives. But it doesn't mean that your sin breaks his heart any less. Do you realize that? Have you sat in the simple fact that your sin breaks the heart of God and it doesn't cause you to mourn? Let me give you some examples of this. We see this in Luke chapter number 5, 15, excuse me, the story uh, of what I like to call the, the prodigal son. And I call it the parable of the loving father where Jesus teaches about a young man who, who wants his inheritance while his father is still alive. And his father gives it to him and he goes into a distant land and that land comes, goes through a famine and the young man loses all that he has and he finds himself uh, uh, in a pig trough. He's eating, working 
working in the pig trough, eating the same things that the pigs are eating. The Bible says he came to himself and he realized that he had sinned against God. And he says, I got to go back home to my father. And watch what happens. Verse 21, it says, and the son said to him on his way home when he got to his father, watch, he says, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Actually, early in verse 17, he says, treat me as one of your servants. Do you have that place where, where you are mourning? You say, I am a sinner, a wretch undone. I don't deserve to be considered a child of God. Do you lament that? Now, let me give you uh, uh, another situation, because even here with, with the, the young man, the prodigal son, he wasn't lamenting that he lost his fortune. He's not lamenting that he was there in a pig uh, trough. He's not lamenting that he took his father's money. No, his lament was that he had sinned against God. See, most of us lament the consequences of sin, not the sin itself. Let me give you another example here. Luke chapter number 7, verses 37 through 38. Many of us know this as the story of the woman that broke open the alabaster box and she cried tears and washed the feet of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, right there in the house of the Pharisee. And here it is that that this Jewish leader is concerned, but, but she washes the feet. And many times we forget the context of that setting. Watch the text here in verse 37. It says, and behold, a woman of the city. Watch this. Underline this if you're not too church in your Bible, it was a sinner. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he being Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. This is a precious, expensive perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, watch this, she was weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Let me just stop here for a moment because most people see the text and note that this is a story about a woman who has washed her feet and she is coming here worshiping. Watch this. She's worshiping by making this incredible sacrifice with this expensive perfume and this ointment. But you got to see before that happens, there is lament. She is weeping because she is a sinner. You got to catch this. Jesus hasn't done anything for her. This is not somebody that is worshiping God. No, no, no. This is someone that has realized their sinfulness in the presence of God's holiness. And it has caused her to weep at the feet of Jesus. Jesus doesn't actually forgive her till a few verses later. Let's go to verse 47. It says, therefore, I tell you, watch the text, her sins, which are many, let's be clear, she's a sinful woman, are forgiven for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, you got to catch this, your sins are forgiven. Watch this. Before her sins were publicly forgiven, she had public lament. And some of us, Lord, help me, we want to celebrate the forgiveness of God, but we don't have contrite hearts. We, we have not lamented over our own unrighteousness. See, true lamenting, true brokenheartedness, true holy sorrow will always push you closer to the feet of Jesus weeping and crying, saying, God, how wretched of a man am I? Verse 50, and he said to the woman, watch the text, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This this is what Jesus is talking about here when he said, blessed are those that mourn, those that mourn their sin, those that mourn the sin of this world. Where does Jesus get this from? Let, let's go back to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, uh, uh, chapter 61, verses 1 uh, uh, through 3. Where does he get this idea, blessed of those that mourn? Why, why are we talking about those that mourn? Uh, uh, here it is uh, that Jesus actually references this verse 
uh, he does what I like to call a, a holy mic drop here. He, he actually goes in and into the, uh, to the temple and he actually quotes this verse and he says this, Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 3, as Isaiah is actually painting the picture of what the Messiah, the Savior, the chosen one, his character, what he will do, what he will be about. Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 3 says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news, here it is, here it is, here it is, to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the what? The what? The brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Watch this, to comfort all who mourn. You got to see that. This is what we call here uh, the year of the Lord's favor. This is what we call the year of Jubilee on the Jewish calendar. This is where the Jews every 50 years would wipe away everyone's debt, free everyone of any obligation. And here it is, the prophet Isaiah saying, Jesus, he becomes our Jubilee. Yes, Lord, he becomes the one that wipes away our debt, that, that frees us of everything that we owe to God. He paid the price on the cross. That is the good news of Jesus Christ, and he does this for those that mourn. We actually go read this in Luke chapter number 4, verse 16 through 21. Jesus actually, he unrolls the scroll in the temple, and he reads these verses, and he says after that, listen, guys, I don't know if y'all know this, because I'm here, this now text is fulfilled. <laughs> he drops the mic, and he walks out, and everybody is enamored by the words that he is saying. This idea that we have to mourn our personal sin. We actually get a clearer picture, I believe, in Isaiah chapter number 6, verses 1 through 7. Here, Isaiah has had an incredible encounter with God. He has a vision. He goes into the temple and God shows him uh, uh, what's going to happen. And I want you to see this. Starting at verse number 1, it says, In the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. This is Isaiah the prophet here, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Woo! Uh, TK, that's the kind of glory we know about, right? Uh, above him stood the seraphim. Only two times in Scripture do we hear about the seraphim, these, these mighty, majestic angels. And each had six wings, with two uh, that covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. These angels are going back and forth, calling to one another, declaring the greatness of God as they see his might and majesty. As big and as great and as awesome of anything that you can imagine, God is more than that. The Bible says, when they're calling, watch what happens in verse 4, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke that Shekinah glory and watch what happens in verse number five when Isaiah sees this when he sees God he says woe is me for I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips underline that in your Bible he says woe is me I want you to see what happens here that Isaiah is in the presence of God he is in the glory of God and in the presence of God he acknowledges his, his weakness. He acknowledges his sin. He says, woe is me. That word woe simply means to unravel. He says, I am ruined. If you go read this in the CSB verse, he says, woe is me for I am lost. I am ruined. I am nothing. I am a sinner. I am an unrighteous man. I am a man of unclean lips. What happens when you come into the presence of God? Do you just simply say God is great? Or do you say, Lord, I in your presence am a sinner? Woe is me. 
So you got to have some woe is me moments in your life. You got to have some moments in your life that you realize, oh my God, even on my best day, even with I'm doing what I think I am most gifted and talented to do, it cannot compare to who God is. Woe is me. I am a sinner, a wretch undone. I'm only a few days into this new year and I've made all these resolutions and some of them I've already jacked up. Woe is me. I need a savior. God, help me. I need someone that's better than I. I need someone that is holy. Woe is me. I have unclean lips. I have an unpure mind. I have a broken heart. Woe is me. Can you say woe is me? See, that's the person that mourns their sin. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Watch the text. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes, watch this, have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Yeah. The prophet Isaiah has this vision, and his holiness of God reveals the sinfulness of self. See, I remember, um, y'all, I remember I was about 16. I was about 16, and I, and I, was, I was getting a little taller. I was a little bit taller uh, uh, than my mother, and I was almost as tall as my dad, and, and I had a woe is me moment. I had a woe is me moment. And I remember me and my dad, we would kind of play, and me and my dad would kind of hit each other, and, and I would kind of run, but I, I, I was getting a little bigger. I thought I was, I was, I was a little stronger, and, and my, my dad, we were playing. He said, son, go on, go on, don't, don't play with me. And I remember my father, he picked me up. In that moment, I mean, he, he, we were in the living room, and he said, go on, go on, now, go on now, we're going to keep playing. And I remember the moment he, he picked me up with such ease, such ease, because here, here's the problem. My, my daddy is what we call country strong. I can't take him over to the gym, he ain't going to throw nothing up, but he country strong. And here it is, that he picked me up smooth out of the air. And he slammed me on the ground and said, I told you, stop playing with me. Here it is, that I had a wall in me. I said, man, I am not, watch this, what I thought I was. Yeah. That he is far greater than I. That I am weak and he is strong. And this is a profound experience for the believer. Because if you don't have the woe is me moment, you will look at yourself and think that you can be righteous. You can do great all by yourself. Yeah. See, the holier we understand God is, the more unrighteous we realize we are. You got to think about this. Isaiah is the prophet, and he still is like, oh, my God. He is the most righteous one in the land. He said, oh, my God, I, woe is me. He simply says, I am a man of unclean lips. He's talking about this idea that, that he doesn't even have the right to, to join the angels in the song of worship of God declaring his greatness. He says, I have unclean lips. He says, I'm not even worthy to, to declare like the angels. I can't even jump in and join in the choir and say, holy, holy. Ho-. I can't even do that. I have unclean lips. You got to catch this. That real perception of the holiness of God always results in acknowledgement of our sin and our need for mercy. Man, I wish I had time to walk into what the mercy seat was because if we got into understanding the mercy seat, we would understand that the mercy seat is created through the worship of the angels. But Jesus Christ dies. He suffers, uh, suffers for us on the mercy seat. His blood, yes, Lord, is shed. He, he is, the, is the atonement for our sins. And that mercy seat is covered because of, of what God did for us through Jesus Christ. And so now when God sees us, when the Spirit of God sees us, he doesn't see our sin. It sees the perfected perfected blood of Jesus Christ. You got to have that woe is me moment. Here it is what we got to do. Here's our response to this. Our application is we have to learn to lament. And here's what I want you to understand about lamenting. It is this. It is this holy sorrow, it is this holy hurt, it is, it, it is not just this idea, I feel bad, but no, God, I am broken about this thing. And one of the things I've learned is that one of the reasons why we struggle with lament is because we struggle with what we long for. Stay with me. 
you will only lament where you long for. You will not lament what you don't long for. So what am I saying? That when you long for the righteousness of God, you will lament your sin and self. Stay with me. When you long for the righteousness of God, you will lament sin. But if you long for for unrighteousness, you, you will lament righteousness. What am I saying? If you long for the things of this world, you will lament righteousness. How do we know this? Because I've been there. You've been there. Where there were things in your life, you said, God, I don't, I don't really want to give. I don't feel like forgiving somebody. I don't feel like serving. When you struggle with the things of righteousness in your life, when you actually lament doing the wrong thing, think about this for a second. It actually tells you what you actually long for. This is why we need the process of sanctification. God, I need you to help me to even know what I should desire and what I should long for. What are you lamenting? Some of you are lamenting a life you once lived. God, help me. That's because that's what you long for. God, I need to long for you. Uh, we got to go number two, number two, number one. We, we got to make sure. Don't ever forget this. Don't ever forget. You got to lament. You got to be sad. You got to be brokenhearted over your personal sin. But the next thing we got to do, this is going to be interesting for us, but I, I think it's right here in the text. We have to be, understand that happy are they that are brokenhearted by corporate sin. This is not something we talk about a lot in church, vertical church, but I want to make sure we walk through this. Uh, uh, here it is, that happy are they that are brokenhearted by corporate sin. This is what I'm saying by, by our sin of our culture and our community and the world. This is a group of people. So it's not just my personal sin because sometimes we don't have a problem saying, yeah, I sinned and you feel bad about that. But, but sometimes you don't know how to lament someone else's sin, something that you didn't do. Let's go back to Isaiah. Uh, Pastor Isaiah, help us out here. In Isaiah chapter number 6, verse 5, watch the text again. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. Watch this part right here. Underline it. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I want you to see this very clearly, that he doesn't just take this personally. There is not just a personal uh, repent or lament. It is also a corporate one. Now, this is what's really important for us to do, especially in our culture and our context, because there was a lot of finger pointing. There's a lot of y'all and us, them and they. And one of the things that Christians do, we don't necessarily pose ourselves against others. We say, Lord, in the same way, we are sinners, not just I'm a sinner. Well, pastor, I didn't do that. Well, Pastor, I I don't live that type of way. But we still call to lament with one another. It's this holy hurt that know that we as a people are unrighteous before the sight of God, and we have broken the heart of God. You got to see this here, that the prophet, he's the preacher, he's the priest, he's the prophet in that particular text, and he does not put himself against or over the people that God has called him to preach to. So let me just say this for those of you that have a habit of judging others and saying, well, y'all do this wrong and y'all do that wrong and this. No, 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 no. We have to lament our sin. Isaiah identified himself with the people he came to preach to. How do you do with that? You can't just say, well, well, Pastor, I didn't own any slaves, so no, no, no. Okay. Well, well, well Pastor, I, I, don't, I don't mistreat women. So, okay, well, well, I took care of my children. Okay, but you still are called to lament. You still should be brokenhearted, not just of something that you've done, but even what others have done. Especially, watch this, when you have benefited from somebody else's sin. <clears throat> we ain't got time for that today. We lament not just our personal sin, but, 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 but corporately. And here is why this is important. I know you're saying, well, Pastor, where is this going? See, when we lament the culture, we do not point the finger in judgment. Watch this. We engage the culture on mission. So what am I saying? If you just simply lament and you're just broken, broken heart over what happens for you, the only person you'll be concerned about is you. 
See, a part of the reason why I, I want to live on mission and I want to share the gospel and I want to make disciples, because I'm not just lamenting my sin. I'm not just brokenhearted over my sin, but I'm also brokenhearted over your sin and your family member and your neighbor and your co-worker. And I want to make sure that they are reconciled with God also, just like I've been reconciled with God. I want them to experience the joy, the peace, the happiness that I have because I know what it means to deserve separation from God when most of them don't. It causes us to engage on mission. Here it is, that we engage justice. We engage the broken to be restored. We engage the hungry to be fed. We engage the weak to be cared for. This is what Jesus came to do. But if you don't lament, if you're not brokenhearted about the corporate sin, you won't engage a global, a communal, a cultural problem. Let's look at the text one more time. Isaiah chapter number 6, verse 5 through 8 says, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Watch this, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. Do you see grace right here? Watch this. One of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Watch this, church. Listen to this. Pay attention. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Do you see it? This is the grace we receive. This is the atonement we receive. Watch how Isaiah responds to this experience. Verse number eight. And he said, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Watch what Isaiah says. Here am I. Send me. Here, here am I. Send me. Don't send me because I want somebody to know my name. Don't, don't send me because I feel like I'm educated or I'm talented or I'm gifted. No, send me because I've been a recipient of the love and the grace. I'm aware of my sin. I lament my sin. I want to engage the culture on mission. He says, send me. See, this is what happens when you properly lament your sin. You lament, you repent, and then you're sent. Yeah, that felt good. You, you lament, you repent, then you're sent. That, that word repent simply means to turn away from your sin and turn to follow God. So here it is that what Isaiah says, listen, I see who I am when in the presence of God, I mourn and lament my unrighteousness. And now I'm willing to go to, to address injustice, to address suffering, to address sin. See, I believe one of the reasons why the church is struggling to go is because we have not come to the feet of Jesus crying, lamenting our sin. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry, Jesus, you don't like it, but... I still really just want to do this. There's a culture, there's a world that, that, that needs justice. Biblical justice. And God is asking the question, who shall go for us? And where are the saints that's going to say, send me, I'll go? It starts with lament. It starts with mourning sin. Jesus didn't just seek spiritual restoration. He also pursued physical restoration. We become a part of the work that needs to take place in a broken world when we realize how broken we are and we know that others are broken. Let me tell you of someone by the name of Brian Stevenson. You may have heard of him. Brian Stevenson there's a movie recently out called Just Mercy. Uh, uh, he tirelessly, uh, him and uh, his team, his staff, uh, have won the verdict reversals, reduction of sentence or release from prison for more than 135 erroneously condemned prisoners on death row. 
I said 135 individuals were on death row, and Brian Stevenson and his staff have worked hard to reverse, reduce, or completely release those prisoners. They have also won relief for hundreds of others wrongly convicted or unfairly sentenced. I bring him up because I believe he is someone that has pursued this work of pursuing justice out of the justice he's received through Jesus Christ. He says these words in his book, my work with the poor and incarcerated has persuaded me that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Finally, I've come to believe that the true measure of our commitment to justice, the character of our society, our commitment to the rule of law, fairness, and quality cannot be measured by how we treat the rich, the powerful, the privileged, and the respected among us. The true measure of our character is how we treat the poor, the disfavored, the accused, the incarcerated, the condemned. We are all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated. We're all implicated. See, I want you to think about this, that, that my faith should cause me to, to not just lament my sin and lament corporally, but to pursue justice in the culture. Hebrews chapter number 3, verse 3 says it like this. I know you all saying, well, where do we see that in the Bible? In verse number 3, chapter number 13, it says this. Remember those who are in prison. Watch this. As though in prison with them. And those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Isaiah chapter number 1 verse 17 says, learn to do good. Watch this, church. Seek justice. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. What does that mean? This word justice simply means or comes from the root word shalom, meaning equity and fairness. That word of correct the oppressor or correct oppression is where we get the idea of speaking truth to power. He's just talking about here defending uh, uh, those that are the fatherless or bringing justice fatherless or plea for the widows. It's actually talking about those that are vulnerable in our culture, those that are underprivileged, those that don't have a voice, those of us that do have privilege, those of us that do have a voice. We have a responsibility to use our voice, use our privilege, and use our power to speak up on their behalf. Why do we do this? It's the gospel again. It's Jesus that used his privilege. It's Jesus that used Use his power. It's Jesus that used his voice to speak up for you and I that are now Christians and believers because in our sin we were underprivileged. In our sin we were disqualified. In our sin we were powerless. And Jesus did what we call redemptive justice for us. And so, in the same way, we as Christians are called to pursue redemptive justice in our culture as a sign that Jesus Christ is Lord, pointing people back to to the gospel. We are called to participate in the reconciliation of our world that we lament after. So how we respond to this? Yeah, we are sent and we serve. I want to encourage you to lament the unrighteousness in our culture, past and present, and ask God, what is your part to help see his kingdom come here on earth. And lastly, number three, we're closing right here. Happy are the brokenhearted in sin, for they find comfort only in the Savior. I want you to remember this, that the cure of our sin is simply a Savior. It's right here again. Let's, let's read it one more time before we go. Matthew chapter number five, verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are the ones that shall be comforted. See, we can make the mistake of trying to comfort ourselves when it comes to our sin, our, our wrong. We, we can sometimes make the mistake of, of trying to, to comfort ourselves with other things. We, we try, to, try to make ourselves comfortable. We, we compare ourselves to others thinking that, that their sin is worse than ours and, and an elevation of their sin will actually push our sin down. Uh, uh, to put, put them down pushes us up. We try to find ways to comfort our sin. Some of us do it with substance abuse. Some of us do it with shopping. Some of us do it with other things. Some of us do it with people's opinions. Some of us do it with work. Some of us do it with money. We're trying to find comfort. And the reality is the only way you can find true comfort, true comfort is with truth. 
See, this is what we understand about this text. We are comforted by this idea that because we are sinners, we admit that we are comforted by the truth of the matter, and that is we have a Savior in Jesus Christ. See, this, this is what I want you to understand, that, that nothing else will actually bring you comfort aside from truth. It, it's insufficient. Yeah, have, have you ever been in the house and uh, you, you're trying to cover yourself up and you, you don't have enough of a cover or whatever it is? I remember my wife, she, uh, she bought some blankets for the couch and... Um, I, I call them little people blankets, TK, because um, they, they don't fit at your boy. I mean, you know, they don't fit me. I, I mean, if I pull them all the way up to the neck, my, my feet out, if I pull them down to my feet, my arms cold. It's just insufficient. And some of us, we, we try to find things that comfort, comfort us. They're insufficient. It's, it's, like, it's like this rag. It's like putting this rag, like trying to put this rag on us, trying to, trying to put, put, put this rag on us, trying to put other people's temporary opinions of us. You, you, you're trying to put a heart emoji to comfort you. Yeah. So some of us, you, you, you're trying to put something, put something on you to make you feel better about yourself. But, but here's the problem. I'm going to try to put it on my back, TK. Just don't, don't laugh at me. Try to, ah, it's, it's not enough to keep me. It's, it's not enough to comfort me. It, it doesn't give me any comfort. It's not, it's not enough. It's insufficient. I want you to see this. That there's certain things in your life that you're trying to find comfort in. It's going to be insufficient. That relationship that you think, well, if this person just feels this way about me, it's, going to, it's, it's insufficient. It's so a temporary gratification. You know, some of us will find something else bigger. You know, that's crazy. It's like, well, man, I, I go to church. Yeah, this, this should be good right here. Yeah. Comfortable. Yeah, that's it right there. Problem is, it don't, it don't, y'all can't even see. It don't get all of me. You know, it don't, it don't do what I needed to do. It doesn't, it's not, it's not enough. It doesn't comfort. Here, here's something I learned. My son, Wesley, he ran into this problem of sharing blankets with his sister. About, about a year or two ago, uh, he, he had his comforter. He had his Paw Patrol comforter. And Wesley went all around the house, and he would just take his comforter off of his bed. Paw Patrol was all over the place. Paw Patrol was all over the place. And he would take it to the kitchen table. He would walk with it in the kitchen. He would go sit on the couch. Wesley would be... Uh, uh, in the floor. And here's what was crazy about it. He was always comfortable. This is what I learned about the comforter. This is what I learned about comfort. Uh, low, uh, uh, comfort does not change what you're in. It changes how you're in it. You got to see this. Because it doesn't matter where he's sitting. If he's on the floor, he's comfortable. If he's on the couch, he's comfortable. If he's at the kitchen table, he's comfortable. If, if he's in his bed, he's comfortable. It doesn't matter what he's in, it, it changes how he's in it. And this is what the truth of God does for us. This is why the truth is our comfort. This is why we can mourn. This is why we can be sad. This is why we can lament our sin because we know the truth of the gospel. We still find comfort. Let, let, me, let me see if I can show it to you. I hope, I hope this don't mess you up here. Uh, this, this is a comforter right here. And see, this is what I love about the comforter. See, this is what Wesley was. Wesley was going around the house just like this. He, he was going around comfortable. And see, this is what you got to do right here. You, you got to put on the truth of God. See, see, some of y'all, y'all at home right now watching the sermon right now. You're in the bed and you're, you're comfortable. You, you got you to gotta wrap up in the truth of God. No, it may not change what you're in right now. God, help me. It's not going to remove the pandemic, but it changes how you're in it. It doesn't remove that you may be struggling right now, but it changes how you're in it. This is the truth of the gospel. And instead of putting on things that are insufficient like your career, trying to put on people's uh, uh, opinions of you, I need you to grab the Word of God. Get you a double-sided Word and say, listen, I'm going to put this thing on and my comfort is going to be in the truth of God no matter where I'm sitting, no matter where I'm laying, no matter what I'm enduring, y'all, I'm as comfortable as I can be because I'm covered in the truth of God. We see it right here in 1 John chapter number 1, verse 9. We are comforted 
to understand that our sin is forgiven. It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can release the lie, God help me, that I have to earn my way to heaven. No, I can put on the comfortable truth of Christ and wrap myself up in that. We can get rid of the burden that we carry in Matthew chapter number 11, chapter verse 28, it says, come to me, God help me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I can work in the truth of God. I can be in a difficult situation, and I can find rest and comfort because I know the truth. See, y'all, y'all, I'm, I'm got a little, a little comfortable here. It doesn't matter what I'm in, I can change how I'm in it with the truth of God. Yeah, I may be sick, but the truth, he's a healer. <laughs> I may not love me, but he loves me. God, help me. See, you got you to gotta wrap yourself in the truth and you'll find happiness. You can mourn your sinfulness, but even when you know that you're a sinner, you can remind yourself of the truth of a Savior. And ultimately, what Jesus is pointing to here, write this down. This is the last thing right here. See that the comfort of heaven will more than compensate all the mourning of earth. Yeah, yeah. Yes, God. I know a lot of people don't want to talk about heaven. Everybody want to go, but don't nobody want to go today. But let's be clear that the truth of the matter is this, that this world will soon pass away. And there is a truth that I get to hold on to, that one day I will be in heaven and I can rest in that truth. I can rest in the truth of the Father that he loves me. I can rest in the truth of the Father that he cares for me. I can rest in the truth of the Father that his Son has rescued me from my broken, sin-sick soul. I need you to encourage yourself, not with lies, not with hopes, not with dreams, but get yourself comfortable with the truth. Happy are those that mourn. They will be comforted doesn't change what you're in. It changes how you're in it. Mm. Today, find the truth. When you find the truth, it will free you to mourn your sin. You can lament. You can be brokenhearted about your sin. But your brokenness should always point you to the truth of who God is. His saving work, his, his loving, forgiving power, that's the truth. And it brings me comfort. Making somebody else feel bad about their sin, that's not going to bring enough covering and comfort. Trying to earn my way, trying to be right enough. I'm not going to always get it right. It's not going to bring me comfort. No, the truth of God's undeserved love. And today, I want you to lament your sin. Lament the culture's sin. Be brokenhearted about it. But you embrace the salvation, the comfort of the truth of Jesus Christ that he died for your sins.